Well, this is great. People are showing up right, right on time. We got, uh, if you saw my email and I know it was forwarded, you know, you might've got it through a different channel than directly from me, but uh, we had pretty good, pretty good response in terms of registrations uh, for, for this meeting. And um, I did ca cast a fairly wide net in terms of the circle of people that have come around the project so far. Um, you know, we wanted, to, we wanted to have that registration so we get a little sense of who was gonna be here and capture some names and, and emails and stuff. But uh, we, want as much, we want as much good input as we can get. Welcome folks, welcome folks. Glad to see people showing up. Um, especially if you were not at the first session, we're really glad that you're here. If you were at the first session, we're glad you're here too. Uh, and we think we're gonna be able to move things forward um, from, from that point. I'm gonna give it another, it's three o'clock right now. I'm gonna give it just another little bit. I do expect probably at least five or six more people. And if you're just coming in, I'll give you the heads up that uh, the meeting settings are to, you, you're muted by default when you arrive. So please don't take that personally, but if you'd like to say hi or have us hear you, make sure you click that microphone button. This is, this is like, this is always like, it's pretty exciting. You start seeing like the big grid fill up, like it's kind of a cool thing. It's a little, you know, I guess it's, it's an analogy to like sitting in a meeting room someplace and people start coming in and filling up the chairs and whatnot. But you know, like people, you can't like sit in the back, like you're just part of the grid. Everyone's is everyone's just as close. It's great. Welcome, folks. I'm recognizing, I'm recognizing names from our, our sort of our growing list of uh, stakeholders and interested parties that are coming together around this project. Um, Peggy Sinclair Morris, I recognize, Meg Stone, I recognize. Uh, if I don't recognize you yet, I'm, I, you're gonna be, you're gonna be on my list of, of folks that uh, favorite people here. So welcome to all. I see Michelle has just come in. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Hi everyone. Hi, hi there. And I'm guessing, I see a phone number down there. I'm guessing that might be Kyle Etheridge. She said she was gonna have to call call in. Hi, Rob. So I am, you might see me with my head down here a little bit. I'm, I am actually writing down some, some names that are new names for me just to make sure that I capture some folks. And also just another another heads up, this has been in the communication. It's been, I think it was on the registration portal. It was in my email today. We are recording um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. We wanna be able to go back and, um, and, and get information out of, out of the session accurately. Also, uh, we have a wonderful uh, uh, partner in this project, Curtis Creative is gonna be creating um, some uh, exciting original media for, for the project. And um, they, will, they may be uh, able to use this footage as well. So there's a couple of reasons why we're, why we're recording. Do you wanna make sure everyone knows that we are doing that? And those are the purposes. Uh, it's not, you know, there's no nefarious purpose for why we're recording. So it's 3.03 um, and we've got, let's see, I'm gonna count one, two, three, four, five. We got 21 people on the call right now, which is fantastic. Um, I do expect, I know some people may have to drop out. Some people may drop in. Um, I think we'll probably be between this number and, I, and we might've kept to 30, I don't know, but um, I am gonna go ahead and I see, it's great. I see some people who were here last time. I see quite a few new people. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just get started with our, um, with our sort of agenda here, which is not super formal. Um, and, and the very first thing I'm gonna mention is that the recording of the previous session is available. And you, you probably have that in an email from me. If anybody needs that link, I can, I'll be happy to provide it for you. I'm gonna say it right now and then I'll say it again, uh, probably more than once. My email is pretty easy to remember. It's grant, G-R-A-N-T, at louisvillevisualart.org. 
Louisville Visual Art is all one. So it's easy to say and remember, it's not so easy to type, but louisvisualart.org. And if you have any questions about uh, getting access to media that I mentioned or, or questions, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, like I say, the video of the first session is available um, to, to watch. And we are uh, in the process of uh, sort of establishing and we will be building a website for this project that's going to be a standalone website. So LVA will be maintaining it. LVA, LVA will be administering that website. I'm hoping to, that we can have that live sometime next week, might be the week after, but we're going to do it as quickly as we can. And that is going to be a, a uh, that is going to collect resources that we've developed around the project, including um, you know, basically a, a basic description of the project. Um, it will have places for input. So there's been some surveys that we've that we put out. Many of you have participated in those. That will be that will continue on that on that website. So uh, this will be something that you can point people to if there's people who aren't in our circle yet. Uh, that will be a great place for them to get involved. We're, we're anticipating that there will be a place there for people to volunteer to be part of the project, um, and that essentially that there will be a number of. Uh, you know, not just resources that are passive, but rather uh, ways to become involved with the project on that website. So uh, one of the things that will be there also is a description a summary of the input that has come through these, these community sessions. The first one was an invitational session. This one has been open to the public. And so we will try to capture in a, in a useful way, uh, a narrative about what people have uh, proposed. And that's gonna drive not just the design, uh, which the lead artist is responsible for, um, but you know, our, our kind of thinking about um, all kinds of decisions: who, who to be, who to have be involved, um, who to um, you know to reach out to for for co contributions along lots of different lines with the project. So um, to to just very very quickly uh, recap, and again, this this lesson session one summary was part of the email I sent. I don't expect people to have read it, you know, and memorized it yet. Um, there will be a quiz later, but uh, I will just tell you that in our first sessions, one of the things that the first session, one of the things that came forward really prominently was the need for audio description um, as a way to make this public art project for the Clifton neighborhood sensory accessible to the blind and visually impaired communities, which is a, a primary purpose of the project. It's not the only purpose of the project, but it's an important one. And so that's something that we'll be revisiting is thinking about how, how, how do we do that? Uh, what are some ways to do that in, in, in maybe some very specific ways? Another thing that came forward is uh, the possibility of some other kinds of sound elements. And I'm just sort of going to go through these quickly just to get people's wheels spinning a little bit around you know, what we're going to uh, talk about. As we get into the discussion, Katie will actually you know, really guide the discussion. OK, so I'm just trying to kind of, again, refresh people's memories, bring people up to speed, and get, your, get you thinking about um, some, of the, some of the things that we can discuss. So um, sound producing elements different than audio description could be things that might produce music or respond to being touched on the, on the artwork itself. Um, another thing that uh, you know, was discussed was uh, the importance of recognizing First Nations and Indigenous people um, as part of the celebration of local history in Clifton. Um, I felt like that was an important thing for us to keep in front of us. Um, we've got a number of people in the circle already who have lots of expertise that they offered. And again, figuring out how we best um, solicit, mobilize, and organize volunteers is going to be something that happens, um, you know, immediately after this and going forward. Um, one of the things that I want to call out in particular that Terry Turla mentioned was that depictions of blind folks need to be really thoughtful and that, you know, a sort of a, a picture of somebody walking with a white cane uh, really kind of Re recapitulates a stereotype that we don't want to fall into. Um, and uh, I thought that was extremely helpful. And, you know, just, just, it's too bad that we need the reminder, but Terry, Terry, I think did the right thing in reminding us that, you know, blind folks make contributions all, all in all ways all the time. And, and that's what we need to see. That's what we need to show uh, and focus on uh, and include in the, in the, in the artwork. So um, there was another suggestion that was made that I'll just throw out, did make it into my description that we might consider some kind of a tactile map that shows the work uh, of maybe of the APH. Um, it wouldn't necessarily have to be limited to that, but how that, how that has impacted across the nation, possibly across the world. Um, there was mention made of, of, of uh, considering the physical approach to the sites. We haven't chosen a site yet. Um, and there was also discussion of uh, 
just keeping in front of us the issues associated with private versus public um, locations for the work. And so we're, we, we're, we've taken all those things and that's, that's all part of what's circulating in our, in our thinking as we go forward. We did have a quantitative survey that people filled out and I do appreciate all the people who did that or who tried to do that. There were a couple of little technical difficulties that I apologize for. Um, and just to very, very quickly, you know, kind of summarize those. Again, audio description emerged very clearly as the, the sensory accessible element or component that um, you know, had the, you know, the most importance. Close behind, very close behind were other things like tactile components, sound producing components, uh, and web hosted content. Those were all rated for 4.7 out of five. Um, and so you know, that was a very helpful, so far that survey has been helpful for us in terms of understanding where priorities are in the community, what people think we should be focusing our energy and our resources on. Uh, so I really appreciate those who've done that. And again, that survey or a similar one will remain available on our website as we go forward. So it's not like if you didn't do that yet, you, you lost your chance. There, there's, it's still, it'll, be, it'll be available going forward. Okay, so again, thanks everyone for being here. I see other people have joined. Um, many of whom I, I recognize and was expecting to see. And I could just give the heads up that you are muted by default when you come into the meeting, but please don't hesitate if you wanna speak to unmute yourself um, and, and contribute. Um, I wanna introduce really quickly, I think most of you sort of already know her, uh, but Liz Richter is our lead artist for the project. And, and it is she, she is the creative wellspring uh, from which this project you know, uh, comes to us. And so, um, Liz did a, a little bit more of an extended presentation in the first session. Again, that video is available. Um, you can watch that if you'd like to. We're, we're going to ask Liz to, to, to say what she'd like right now and to be here as uh, in her role to, to listen, absorb, and keep us on track um, as we go forward. So Liz, with that, give it to you. All right. Thank you, Grant. Thank you all for coming to the second meeting. I'm really excited to see some new faces. So I'm going to just briefly introduce myself since I don't recognize all of you. I don't know if we've met personally or not. So um, my name's Liz Richter and I've been doing public artwork in Louisville for around six years now. Um, my background's in art education and I have about 10 years of experience in the art realm. And I've been living in Clifton for about six years. I live on Sycamore uh, with my husband and our five-year-old son. And um, I do a lot of murals and public art pieces around town and have been involved in the art community a lot of different ways. Um, my artwork is known for just fun, joyful, interactive and colorful imagery that is layered with symbolism. And I love to connect to communities and tell those stories. So um, this project came about through neighborhood walks. We deliver the Clifton Quarterly. And um, I've also spent a lot of time visiting the School for the Blind through their residency program. And so um, through those interactions with the Clifton community, I realized that I wanted to draw attention to the really unique culture of Clifton and specifically the history and heritage of the visually impaired community here. I just think it's a really unique quality of our neighborhood that we could um, celebrate and bring to the forefront and really show the, the entire city and even um, you know tourists who visit the area because of all the great restaurants and shops like really just highlight that this is a unique place with a lot of really talented and diverse individuals in a very inclusive neighborhood. So that's kind of where the idea came from and I've worked with LVA in a lot of different ways over probably the last I don't know eight or nine years at this point and um, they have facilitated a lot of other projects that I've been involved in or led such as the Smoketown Mural Fest, the Hikes Point mural that I, that I did which is one of the largest murals in the city and um, the new Albany Kroger mural. Those are all examples of projects that LVA facilitated for me that involved community input. And so this is just another continuation of that relationship. And um, I'm grateful that they saw the vision for this project and have helped me organize it and get it to the point where we can start bringing ideas to the public. And that's what they're good at. And so they're allowing me to take on the role of just truly getting to listen and be the artist and then hopefully translate what you all have to say today and start a 
designing, which I'm super excited to finally get to. Um, I originally came up with this idea almost two years ago. I wrote a proposal for this, um, just kind of randomly at my kitchen table. And uh, to see how far it's came at this point is, is really exciting. So what I hope to get from this session is I, I'm hoping to interpret and combine some of the shared values and ideas that we talk about today into visuals. And then from that point, I will bring those um, sketches to stakeholders along with some written interpretation and um, get feedback from that, them. And then from there, we'll create a final design and then begin the implementation. Um, and it's a long process. So we're at the very beginning of that. So the end result is what we're hoping for is a final spot that is transformed into a landmark for the Clifton neighborhood and is activated as a public space specifically for um, the visually impaired community, but also for Clifton as a whole. And um, uh, so Grant and the LVA team, they're gonna help me review this, the notes and feedbacks from this session and kind of help me narrow down the approach. And I'm looking for a lot of keywords and phrases that resonate or just common themes that come up through these conversations. Um, I wanted to share with you the project goals that I wrote out that have really evolved a lot over the past six months or so. I'm just going to share these with you where they're at now. And, um, you know, if you would like to give me feedback at some point, I do, I do, I am open to that. So what we have so far for project goals is demonstrating the universal properties of art by prioritizing a sensory inclusive approach with accessibility incorporated into the space and the work itself. And then a second goal, activating spaces on Frankfurt Avenue to create a sense of place or neighborhood marker that signifies the unique culture and history of Clifton. A third goal is telling stories and celebrating the unique history of Clifton. And a final goal is building connections and understanding between the sighted and blind communities within Clifton with input from organizations that serve those populations. So um, just to summarize, I'll, I'm gonna hand this back over to Grant, but this is the beginning of the design phase and this input will inform my creative process um, as we continue through that design phase. And it's, your thoughts and ideas are really important to that. So feel free to share those when we get to that point in this session. Thanks, Grant. Yep, thanks, Liz. And I, don't, I want to mention uh, now that it seems like probably a lot of us have settled in who are going to be here. Um, none of this would be happening without the Kentucky School for the Blind Charitable Foundation. Um, they, they, um, you know, this is totally driven by their generosity uh, with a matching grant, and there have a number number of other funders have come along uh, side with that, including uh, Metro Government and the Fund for the Arts, South Arts, which is a, a regional regranter. Uh, individual donors uh, through LVA's fundraising, and um, I think there's some others in the pipeline too. So, but KSBCF uh, has really been just uh, you know the 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 driving force be behind you know making this happen in terms of uh, the 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 fact that checks have to be written. Um, so we we appreciate them. We thank them uh, for that, and uh, want to make sure that they're recognized as we go at every step as we go forward. And um, I do want to I do want to hand this over to Katie here in a second, but I also want to point out that as Liz talks about the design process that's going to that's going to accelerate after this meeting, um, that is the kind of thing that we will track in an, in an appropriate way on the website that I mentioned. So we'll we'll be able to share as we have things that can be shared. Um, you know, there's a process as Liz pointed out, and we need to go through those steps. Um, but as we can, uh, we will we will start to share some of uh, what's coming out of, of her work um, in that in that format. And I'd like to now ask uh, Katie Dalahanty, who's the other LVA staff person on this project, to to sort of take it over. And she's gonna she's gonna keep us all on track, productive. She's gonna maximize the value of this meeting going from this <laughs> point forward. Oh, you really made me out to be a taskmaster, but I am happy to be here. Um, I wanted first to recognize one of our biggest champions in this effort, which has been John Roberts from the KSBCF, who is the liaison between multiple different people. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, John. We would not have been here without you. Um, 
Oh, we have a lot to cover today, but one of the things to make this very digital process more personable, I would like to call on each person to just say hi and tell us why they are here. Um, we've already met Grant and Liz, um, but let's start off with Mike O'Leary. I know. Hello. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Hello, uh, uh, I'm Mike O'Leary. I'm the president of the Clifton Community Council, and, uh, and, and we're very excited about this project as part of our soon-to-be Clifton neighborhood treasure. And thank you so much, Liz, for uh, uh, for championing this. And, and also, I do want to do a shout out to uh, to Brad and Charlotte Stingle. Uh, thank you for uh, jumping in. Uh, uh, they are at the corner of Pope and uh, Frankfurt Avenue. They are the uh, Champagnery and and all. The and all around wonderful people. And also they're the aunt and uncle of Eric Whitworth, uh, who's an awesome character. So uh, so thank you for, for everybody for showing up. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thanks for bridging that. How about we actually call on Charlotte to see if you introduce yourself. <laughs> like the hot potato game, isn't it? We're gonna keep passing it around. Well, hi everybody. Thank you, Mike. And thank you all of you for inviting Brad and, and me. Um, we are the owners of the 1764 building, that Victorian beauty that's right on the corner of Pope and Frankfurt. And we're also down on Main Street with Stengel Hill Architecture. So you may know us from that community as well. And we're really happy to be here. We're excited about hearing about this initiative. So thank you for inviting us. Yes, hello, Brad. Would you like to say anything too? Uh, no, you know, we're just trying to catch up here. Unfortunately, we're a little behind the times, I think sometimes with the, uh, with news, so but we're, we're learning as we go here. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we've been in the neighborhood for about three decades though. So we're, we're veterans in the neighborhood, but we're excited to hear about this initiative. And we always love being referred to as Eric's aunt and uncle too. That's a, that's a favorite <laughs> title as well. And we're big Mike fans too. So yeah, it's all good. Thank you. Um, so Michelle Brown, if you'd like to introduce yourself as one of the other champions here of this project. Hello. Hi everyone. My name is Michelle Brown and I'm the executive director at the Kentucky School for the Blind Charitable Foundation. And we are very excited about this project and looking forward to partnering with LVA and several other organizations in the community. I also live in Crescent Hill, walk a lot in Clifton, so love the neighborhood and excited from a personal aspect too. Thank you. Well, welcome. Christian Anderson is the executive director of LVA. Would you please say hello and, and say anything you'd like? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so Katie, uh, I guess, sort of uh, filled in my role here. So I just moved uh, to Louisville uh, in mid-July. So I've been here six, seven months now. And uh, it was great to sort of be able to walk into an organization with the history of LVA and have this sort of project, you know, already underway um, and as something that was a really inspirational thing to, to be able to, to sort of wrap my mind around right away. And I really want to thank uh, everyone on this call and all of sort of you know, LVA's staff and supporters, um, you know, the School for the Blind Foundation. Uh, Rob, I know you're on here from the board um, to who have all, you know, and everyone who's here. Um, it's been great and a great project to work with. And so I'm just proud to have had the chance to, to walk into something so special. Thank you. And with that, Rob, would you mind going next? Hi, everybody. My name is Rob Gillen. I am the Special Programs Coordinator at the American Printing House for the Blind. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be um, able to help with this magnificent project. Um, I am a huge uh, fan of uh, this particular initiative, especially since its reach will be so uh, widely felt. It'll be um, something that's going to be really good, not only for the field that I work in, but for our neighborhood and for, I believe, Louisville as well. So I am absolutely thrilled to be able to assist and to be uh, present at these meetings. So thank you. 
Thank you, Rob. Um, Catherine Cohan, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce anyone's names in advance. I know that is correct. Um, hi, I'm actually, uh, Mike just invited me. We were looking um, to purchase a home in Clifton and it, we just ended up, in, it wasn't working out, but we love the neighborhood. Um, I'm actually friends with Paula Watkins, the head of Holy Trinity Clifton campus. I was a teacher at Holy Trinity for six years and saw the, the school kind of get built up. Um, but I'm now an art teacher at Hawthorne Elementary and I'm just excited to hear about the project and see if I can be involved or even get my students involved in any way if that's possible. So Thank I'm you. here to listen right now. I'm brand new. Perfect. Well, welcome. Jeanette Wicker. Sorry, technical problems. I'm Jeanette Wicker. Um, I'm also a board member of the Kentucky School for the Blind Charitable Foundation. And I'm retired from APH and the Kentucky School for the Blind. And this is of interest to me. Enjoyed being here. Perfect, welcome. Katie Carpenter. You're on mute, ma'am. Okay, no? Okay, I'm Katie and I'm with the Museum of APH and through that Braille Readers Theater. I heard about this project from a number of people and I think it sounds wonderful and I'm ready to do whatever you all would like me to do. Thank you. Appreciate it. Patrice Ising or Ising? It's Ising. Um, I currently work at the School for the Blind or this is going on my third year, but I've done some art residencies there in the past, as well as the community. So I'm really invested and interested in adaptive kinds of projects. Um, have learned a lot of along the way and love the idea that our kids could potentially be give input. Thank, Thank you. Sarah Lindgren, who I personally am such a fan of. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, thanks. I'm happy to be here. The feeling is mutual. <laughs> Um, I'm Sarah Lindgren. I am an arts administrator with Louisville Metro Government. Um, I um, have the privilege of working on public art projects and, and um, loved an opportunity to, to uh, work with community members on a, a community-led project. I've had the joy of working with Katie and with LVA and with um, Liz on previous projects. So i um, happy to see this group together. I'm also a resident of Clifton. I've lived here for about 15 years. I'm right down the street from the Champaignery. So I'm happy to be here um, in support of my own neighborhood as well. Thanks. Thank you. James Graham. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm the mobility coordinator with Louisville Metro Public Works. So do a lot with our bike and pedestrian programs and also uh, working on getting our complete streets and vision, vision zero campaigns up and running. Um, I actually just saw um, an invite for this on Facebook as something I might be interested in, and I was, so um, I am here for, for that reason. I, I live in Stenselberg, but I'm actually currently looking at a house in Clifton, so maybe I'll be a neighbor soon. <laughs> Perfect. Jonna with an exclamation point. Hey, super professional, right? Um, hi, everybody. I am Jonna Ebling. I got invited to this meeting yesterday um, by Liz and Mike, um, probably because I um, have been working in archives and museums and libraries here in town for about, um, gosh, seven years now. So I'm also a Clifton resident. I've been in Clifton for seven years, which I just did the math on that. And I really thought it was four. So clearly I have no clue, like, what year it is, where I'm at. Um, I have a 13 month old, so that's my excuse. Anyhow, I'm really excited for this project, you guys. I think this seems like a great idea. Um, like some of the other folks, I'm a little behind the times on everything that's going on. So I hope to catch up a little bit and um, read up on some of the past meeting notes. But otherwise, um, thank you, you guys, for inviting me. And I look forward to learning more. Perfect, thank you. And now, Joanna Miller. Hi, I'm Joanna. I'm a Clifton resident, and I'm also the director of education at KMAC Museum. Um, we have a residency with KSB, and uh, I've worked with Liz in the past. So anyway, 
that the museum and the children we work with can be involved or me as a resident. Um, that's why I'm here. Thank you. And Keith Waves, please. You there, Keith? All right. We'll move on to Casey Chalmers. Hey, I'm uh, <laughs> listening and trying to do some child care at the same time. Um, um, I'm Casey. I'm with uh, Curtis Creative, and we are going to be helping uh, document this process and this project. And um, I'm basically here to just listen in on um, all of the ideas that uh, get tossed around today. Perfect. Thank you. And totally understanding child care. Uh, I, I personally do not have them, but I have so many friends trying to do that during COVID. So um, thank you for joining. Meg Stone. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Okay, maybe not present. iPhone. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's somebody listed as iPhone. Okay. Hi, I'm sorry. This is Meg. I was on the phone. No problem. <laughs> um, I'm Meg Stone. I'm a former teacher and outreach director from the Kentucky School for the Blind, and I am on the um, uh, board at the Charitable Foundation. Thank you. So Meg. I've been in the field of visual impairment since the early '90s. Wow, that's some that's some investment for sure. Um, how about the person listed as iPhone? Okay, I'll move on to Peggy Sinclair Morris. All right, thank you. Hi, this is Peggy. We're... I am really embarrassed here because I was double, I was multitasking. I was on a phone call with my HR person and I completely missed it, just said to unmute. So did you have a question for me? No, just say hello and let oh. us know why you're here. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. Um, it has been a day. Hi, I'm Peggy Sinclair Morris. I'm the principal at the Kentucky School for the Blind. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited about this project and ex um, looking forward to seeing how our kids can possibly help and be involved. And um, Please excuse my appearance today. <laughs> so, working oh, from home, and um, like I said, it's been quite a day today. So, but really, well, really, really, I'm excited about this, and was really excited when John proposed it, and I heard Liz speak at the charitable at a charitable meeting, and um, so looking forward to working with everybody. And just let me know what I can do to help. Welcome. Thank you. And last but not least, one five zero two eight three six da 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 da. I don't know who that is, but if you want to say hello, please do so now. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, hi. This is Kyle Lethbridge with Councilman Hollander's office, and we're just excited to be partnering with you all and learning more about the project and sharing more community input, but um, we're, we're really excited to be part of this and uh, um, hopefully have some new partners. Perfect. Well, hello. Thanks for joining. So basically, I felt that it was very important for each of us to say who we are and what reasons we're here or what, you know, what we can offer, because one of the most important things about this is how do we identify people that potentially Liz can talk with separately to mine information from that helps inform a design process and an, out, an outcome that people enjoy and embrace. So thank you for taking the time that might have seemed laborious, but I'm really happy to hear that you're all here for the right reasons and are supportive. Um, so there is going to be a few prompts that I'm going to lead each of us through. Uh, Probably the best way to let us know that you want to speak is either by motioning with your hand itself or to put something in the chat or put the hand up button in the um, it, that will notify the screen so I can call on you. Uh, you know, and if 
for some reason, none of those techniques work, I will be embracing whomever to unmute themselves and just go for it. So if that happens, I'll deal with it. Um, so one of the, the things that we wanted to do today is to kind of hone in a little bit more on specific things that came from the last meeting and the surveys. Um, so a really, really important piece of this is the, the sensory accessibility aspect of this public artwork. Um, we wanted to see if people had any input per, on particular things like audio description, sound on site, whether that be speaker elements, sound music, wind chimes, tactile surfaces, web hosted content, music, poetry, fiction, history, et cetera, possibly created by a host of communities and also um, olfactory sensory type things, you know, things that deal with smell, plants, whatever that can activate a different sense. So these were some of the things that people um, noted were important to them. And if anyone has any specific ideas or things that they have seen through their travels or from their own personal experiences, we would love to hear about that right now because Liz can um, definitely hear about general things, but if there are specific uh, things that people are thinking about, this would be a great time to hear about it. So if anybody has any ideas about how audio description can be included in a public artwork, sound, tactile, web hosted um, content, or anything to do with smell, Please let us know if you have any, uh, you know, connections with these things, any ways we can uh, hear about things that you've personally been working on. All of that is relevant. I will call, so, yes. Someone this is Peggy. I'm sorry. Do you want us to raise our hands or? Yeah, raise your hands if you have your video on or you can note something in the chat or you can just speak. Okay, um, this is Peggy. So one thought um, in, in thinking about individuals with visual impairment, um, you, you know, definitely want the tactile piece to it, but you also want to consider you have individuals that have different levels of, you know, there's very few individuals that are totally blind. You know, it's a very small population, but, you know, looking at color and contrast, that kinds of things, because sometimes if you have all these magnificent colors in it that can be visually overwhelming i mean you, i'm not saying to make it just black and white but just kind of taking into consideration co the contrast of the different colors that you're using perfect and have you found that that not only would relate to a mural or um you know paint on a wall but let's say web-based content would yes. you suggest something similar for that as well Yes, and you know, if you do web-based content, making sure that everything is accessible as far as, you know, there's screen readers, there's, again, a button where people can go in, you can add a button and add in, people can customize it to, you know, black background, white print, you know, just keeping in mind things like that, making sure that it's all accessible if you use um, you know, Word tends to be better, but if it's a PDF form, that it's an accessible format. Thank you. Hey, I'm going to jump in real quick. Peggy, I really appreciate that. I want to ask a question here. Um, I think what you're saying with regard to color value is that people who um, are not visually impaired might not recognize how, how difficult it could be to see two different colors that are of similar values next to each other. Have you Do you have experience with people you know, working up a design that might be in full color, designed to be in full color, but then looking at it in, in black and white in order to understand that, that contrast. I see Liz nodding. Does that seem like a, something we should keep in our, yeah. Got a big thumbs up from Liz. Okay, great. Fantastic. And I saw Katie Carpenter nodding uh, quite a bit. And I know that you have some um, expertise in this stuff. Do you have any thoughts on uh, what, uh, you know, audio, sound, tactile services, 
web hosted content, any of these things or smell seem appropriate? Um, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, first, I wanted to um, second everything Peggy said. There's so many different abilities to see and blindness is about full blindness is about 8% of them. Um, and strong and everybody sees it differently. Also, so there's a lot of areas in that visual part of it. But I wanted to put in a vote for um, sound installations. I'm sure y'all have been to them where your movements indicate what sound shows up. And I actually went to one in Indianapolis with, with a blind friend and she adored it. So um, anything like that where we can involve sound elements, I really like. And in Indianapolis, was there a specific place where you guys uh, engaged oh, with that? Yeah, it was the Art Museum. This was about eight years ago. And it was a room you walked into and where you moved and how high you raised your hand. And I think there's a similar one at the, this, the um, you know, our local art museum. Okay. Be, this be, the sorry, museum. Away from it. Yeah, they have something in their kids area where you can go in and make movement. I think it recalled sound. Do you know it? I don't, but I do know there's something at 21C where movement uh, and video projection, there's some interactive pieces. Again, that's more visual, but I'll, we will definitely look into what you're talking about, probably at the speed. Yeah, the one in Indianapolis was without any visuals at all. Okay, thank you. The speed was Art Sparks, and I don't know if they still, it's been a long time. My kids are in college now, so it's been a long time since I've been there with my children, but it was um, allocated in transitional areas. So when you walk through a tunnel, your movement through that space would trigger the, the sound. Oh, nice. Space. Okay. It also had, I think, a light component with it. Um, where the light would change as well, in, in addition to sound. And I don't, I don't know if those were paired throughout the whole place, but I know that there were certain parts where that would also happen. Perfect, we will look into that. And the, the more specific we get, the more that we can drill into these things. Um, I see that Terry just joined us, welcome. Uh, you were with us the previous meeting and you were so valuable with your input. Um, particularly speaking from a personal place uh, in terms of some of the things we're talking about today, which uh, just to get you up to speed, we are talking about sensory accessible components and getting into some specificity about those things. Um, does anybody else want to chime in on particular, uh, you know, ways we can- uh, James has his hand up, Katie, sorry to- I can't see James, but yeah. Oh, I, I had it, I raised it in the participant thing. Oh, there we go, yes. Anyway, yeah, I was just messaging Sarah about this, but um, she would know more about the specifics of the project than I did, but I, I immediately thought of Todd Smith and his Bike Sense project on the Big Four Bridge where he was transcribing, you know, climate data and air quality data into different soundscapes. And I thought that was a really, really interesting project. Mm. I think I walked into that and didn't realize there was those nuances. Great. Yeah, there, there were signs standing by, but it, um, if you didn't notice them, it might be kind of confusing. But, you know, if you took the time to, you know, figure out like different notes were, I think, assigned to different riders. And then there was uh, the pitch was kind of, I, I don't know all the specifics of it, but it was cool. Um, each, all the ways the sounds work, were describing something about the air quality or the speed, or I, I'm not entirely sure of all the different factors that went into it. Yes, I am actually very familiar with that project. Um, I have a five-year-old and we spent a lot of time on the Big Four Bridge. I love that project and we've actually had some talks with Curtis Creative already about using the idea of sights and sounds on, on Frankfurt Avenue as a way to incorporate audio. Um, and what that and what that could look like. So yeah, thank you for sharing that, reminding me about that project. I love that. Absolutely. I'm gonna call on Sarah Lindgren, and even though she didn't raise her hand, uh, <laughs> and then I'll I'll get to you, Mike. Um, Sarah, in terms of sound, um, I'm hoping we can have an opportunity to talk about what we we can and cannot do in the public. Um, because I'm sure that that makes there's a difference there. Sure, and I think um, 
I think a lot of that will depend on the specific site once you've determined the specific site. But I think just generally speaking, the things to keep in mind, I mean, the city has a noise ordinance, which, you know, comes into play more like, you know, louder than life festival or something like I, I can't imagine that we're going to be dealing with such a loud amount of sound that we would be um, in violation of the noise ordinance, but there is that to consider. Um, and then, you know, just from experience with other public art projects, I think, you know, like the bike sense project, you know, we've just talked about for a minute, good, you know, good signage is important to describe, you know, why you're hearing this sound. Um, and then, um, um, of course, we would need to think about um, anyone in the surrounding area that might not love the sound, who might hear it all the time. <laughs> We've run into that with um, sculptural objects that have like wind chimes or something like that, that can be very disturbing to people that hear it all day, every day. So we would want to think about that as well, whether the sound was continuous or periodic, you know, do you activate the sound or is it just on all the time? Um, and then um, lastly, you know, largely depending on your site, you would want to make sure that there was no chance for interference with um, traffic signals, you know, that, um, that our community members are depending on um, for safety. Um, train, you know, we have a train signal in the middle of Frankfurt Avenue. So all of those kinds of things to make sure that we're not um, in conflict with something that people are relying on for safety. So those are just kind of general things that would come to mind, but I think you'd want to get much more specific on that when you have a, you know, a definite site or, you know, a short list of sites that you're exploring. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mike? I, I'm not sure how to, uh, to ask this question, but I, I, I want to be able to wrap my head around the mural, the physical aspect of the mural, uh, about the space, uh, the size. Uh, is this like a freestanding mural or is this something that's going to be alongside a building? Uh, is it something like uh, at the corner of Vernon and Frankfurt Avenue, there's a, a grassy spot uh, that's a, that could be part of what uh, used to be uh, the, well, it, uh, I can't think of the name. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a, a side of the building. Or is it, you know, I, ideally I, I would love for it to be in front of uh, United Christian Hill Ministries at UCA gym at the corner of state and, and, and Frankfurt. So a, a, as we're talking, can you give me what you envision, uh, what the size scale would be? Uh, and, and of course I, I'm all, especially for kiddos, I, I'd love the idea that, that some kiddos would be able to climb something or reach something, pull themselves up. Uh, and that's when uh, I, I uh, turn out to be the adults in the room and say, oh, we have to worry, worry about liability in case a kiddo falls off and hurts themselves. Uh, so, so anyway, can you, uh, Liz or, or, or James or, or Katie, uh, oh, Jeff, not James, uh, Grant, uh, kind of give us an idea of what we're kind of shooting for in regards to what the mural physical aspects will be? So I will jump in first and then I'll hand it to Liz. But the first thing I want to say is that is a really, really important question. And I think that we all want to know that answer, right? So this, this, the, we've had one meeting so far to hear people's input. This is the second meeting. Um, and then, you know, some of the prompts that we've given in a survey are about sites. And so uh, part of the process or part of a healthy transparent process is to hear the community first, get their insights on things that they would like, like what sites are potentials, what kinds of ways this public art uh, could be engaging, whether it's visual, you know, have some visual elements or not, tactile sound, web-based content, all of these things. And after um, we get this community input, Liz is able to decipher what was the priorities and that will help you get those answers. So we're not there yet, but we will definitely make sure all of that is communicated to the public in a very transparent way when we're there. Does, does that sound fair? Great. And Liz, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, Mike, thank you for asking that question because I think that's where a lot of our brains go immediately. Like, oh, where's this gonna be? You know, um, partially just out of excitement and, and, um, 
and I'm to the point where I really want that answer soon as well. But Katie's very right that we do have to go through this process um, to kind of work through what our major priorities are and then try to fit the space the best we can to meet those and then turn around and um, take the space and then try to fit as many of these objectives into that space as we possibly can with the budget that we have you know allotted to do this project with and i'm a very site specific artist um, so for me personally i have to see the physical space and react to that to really even dig into the um to the design process so that is at the forefront of of what we would want to do very soon is narrow down that but um first we want to make sure that we're choosing a site that will meet as many objectives of what the community is looking for as we can and, and by gathering all of these thoughts and ideas that's how we're going to do that so I can't wait. That's the part I can't wait for because, like I said, it, it will really it will really inform my design process for sure. And um, I have been looking at that corner spot that you mentioned and thinking about how that's different than what I originally was thinking. Um, but we will, you know, we'll we'll get into that conversation sooner than later. I hope. But but yeah, there's a lot of potential, a lot of ideas. Um, and I can't wait to get to that part. <laughs> Liz, and, and just to drill down into it a little bit more, as we do this, you know, when it comes to art that is accessible to the public, there are so many layers and so many different pathways to get there. And there is no easy linear jump you can make. It is all dependent on legality issues, whether uh, it's privately owned or publicly, you know, if it's a government building the historic restrictions like all of these things are going to factor in here so um we will get those answers to you soon mike thank you katie do you mind if i do you mind if i really quickly yes please add something okay so what what katie is saying is is that we're building the plane as we are taxiing on the runway and that is i think a metaphor a lot of people hear a lot uh, but one thing I want to point out is that as we try to have all the elements converge onto choosing a site and being able to get things in a, in a more physical kind of um, shape, the, the element that came, came forth from some of our early conversations, which is to have a, a really robust web connected element, right? I think in my mind, that piece, which frankly was not something I had been tracking until it came up. I think it came through a conversation with Carla Rushaval actually was where that kind of first came forward in a really prominent way. To me, that is a kind of, in a weird way, it's a kind of a virtual extension of whatever space we end up with in the neighborhood. And that is where, you know, whatever, whatever we have to do in terms of, you know, I, I guess the word would be compromise or finding out, you know, what the site can support if there's things that it can't support that are still really important to the project, we've got this other this other space basically, which is the, the the virtual space in which we can try to do some of that. So I just wanted to just remind everybody about that, right? So yes, the, the site selection process is really complicated, but with this particular initiative, you've got this great element, which is that we we kind of extend that whatever that physical space is, we extend that into virtual space as well, and that's where we can address you know some some, some things. So. And lastly, before we move on to the next topic, it may be a site or sites. So that also will be determined um, by community input, what is the most important. And also we want to make sure that the KSBCF is always um, able to give their input as a, one of the largest stakeholders. And so we'll be having private meetings with them about is it sites for a tour aspect or site. So we will um, continue to engage on that topic. Uh, so next, we wanted to kind of, uh, you know, maybe you can give this now, or if you feel that you, you can't think of it right now, there will always be this website where you can fill in information as you think of it. But we were hoping to find consultants on technology for the blind and, or low vision, um, integrating audio, and if people had contacts for that, that would be a great thing to know. Um, we also were hoping to hear about local historians um, that are important to the Clifton neighborhood, 
visually impaired or low vision or completely blind artists or creatives that people have in mind that could be um, a good asset to this project. And the last being a contractor for sculpting or collaborating an installation. Um, so if anyone has ideas about who that could be or thoughts of you know, individuals, it would be great to know. Let me open that up. Okay. Yes, Katie, please. Unmute first. Good, did that. Um, just to tell you that the museum has done a lot of research into the history of Clifton. We actually have an historical walking tour and we could easily share all that information with you. And then the person I wanted to recommend in terms of an artist is Darren Harbour. I saw he was on the mailing list, but he hasn't showed up. Just brilliant, creative person. And his background before he lost his vision was in visual art. Thank you. Katie, I love that suggestion. He's also very active in um, performing yeah. arts now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know- before, before we move on from that point, I just wanna say if anybody knows Darren and, and um, can speak to him, please encourage him to get in touch with me. I, I have reached out to him. He doesn't know me, I haven't met him. So he may be um, understandably uh, <laughs> a little bit re reluctant, but um, I would love to get connected with him if somebody thinks that they might be able to make that handshake. I'd love it. Thank you very much, Katie. Yeah, and-, um, and Grant, this is Keith. I know him actually pretty well. I know him pretty well. So I could, I could uh, get him on the phone and push him on that. And Keith uh, is with the LVA team. Um, we did not get a chance for him to introduce himself. Um, James, you have your hand up. I don't know if that was from before or if it is now. Uh, I think it was from before. Okay, thank you. All right, Jeanette. A um, couple of different things. There are, I do have contacts with people who have worked um, in graphic design for visually impaired, but I would really like to contact them first. Should they be interested? To whom should they, who should they contact? Okay, right. got it. Perfect. And of course, you know, all of this will be um, led by Liz's um, input and what, you know, whom she thinks would be the best fit to work with. But we would love for everybody's resources to either go through this website that we will be providing to you or to Grant's email. Okay. Does anybody else have any suggestions of either historians, consultants for technology, or sculptors, or visually um, different visual levels of artists? Okay. If anyone comes up with ideas in the future, please feel free to um, reach us in the ways that I've described previously. Um, so here's the, probably the funnest prompt, and it's our last one because I know we have, are running out of time or just about run out of time. Um, what is your favorite thing about Clifton? Or is there a word specifically that comes to mind about Clifton that you find uh, kind of encapsulates your feelings about the neighborhood? Uh, I'll give a few more. Is there a place or event in history that was important to the neighborhood that you feel would be uh, needing to, to have some attention to for this project? Or a person living or deceased that epitomizes Clifton? Terry, you have got your hand up. Thank you. Um, I was going to respond to the previous question regarding tactile graphics. And I do have someone in mind who is uh, a creative tactile graphics project leader at American Printing House, who also happens to be my neighbor and who is retiring and who may be interested and who will have a lot of time. So I'd like to mention Fred, Frederick Otto, O-T-T-O, and I will talk to him about this. Um, when it comes to words, I think this is a wonderful, wonderful um, stem to respond to. And I would say warm and multifaceted. 
Mm. Love that. What about anybody else? Anybody have a word that comes into mind about Clifton? Since that seems like a, uh, maybe it, it'll feel, make everybody feel included like they can share. What about you, Michael Leary? Or no, 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 okay, Charlotte, go for it. Hi, sorry, Mike, you can go ahead. You wanna go ahead? We might say the same things, actually. We think a lot alike. Um, we've been in that area for a long time. And one of the things, well, two of the things that come to mind, and it's funny that Terry mentioned multifaceted because that's exactly the word that I was thinking is multifaceted, but also it's um, historically connected but it's currently relevant. It's, it's a city that's like, a, or it's a part of the city that's really a portal to the downtown urban community, the riverfront and the neighborhood, you know, prominent neighbor, when I say prominent, I mean, vibrant, um, active neighborhoods, like the Clifton neighborhood, Crescent Hill, you know, all of those areas. So I, I see us always as a portal. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we have an opportunity because of that portal to connect a lot of different parts of the city. And, um, and we've just watched it on, on the corner of Frankfurt um, and Pope Street. We've watched that area really evolve and develop and grow, but also stay very connected architecturally with the past and culturally with the past while being very welcoming and bringing in new um, energetic ideas too. So there's kind of a dichotomy, a, a conversation that's going on there that I think is very unique to that part of the city that's, that's represented in that part of the city that we don't see in other parts of the city. That's a beautiful way to put that. Terry, do you have your hand up again or is that from previously? Sorry, that was previous and I didn't take it down. Okay, and James, is that still from previously? No, I just figured okay. out that I had to lower my hand and then raise it again. So I just lower, I raise it, just raise it. Um, but again, this is coming from somebody who doesn't live in Clifton, but I spend a lot of time there. Um, but my favorite thing about the neighborhood has always been um, the varying relief, you know, just relief as it like topographic relief. There's all kinds of like nooks and crannies within the neighborhood and it's like really easy to find like, a unique spot that you just kind of love in the neighborhood, like all the different pedestrian courts. Um, I think that's why I've always really liked the neighborhood, just the varying landscape that exists in there. It's not, it doesn't really exist within a lot of neighborhoods in Louisville. What would be a word? Would it be top, topographical or what, what's your word? Well, relief could be, I mean, yeah. Perfect, thank you. I, I want to I want to inject one thing to, to for people to maybe think about here. It's prompted by what James just said. Um, it could come forward now. It could come forward later. But if people have, for example, a favorite view, a favorite spot you like to stand in, and then you know you're going to see a particular kind of urban, you know, scape, right, a cityscape, uh, that could be helpful. That could be something that you know we could go and photograph from that spot, um, and maybe you know that could inspire lots of different kinds of, of directions but i'm just thinking that that might be a way to get real specific in terms of like what, what is my favorite corner to stand on in, yeah. in, in clifton and look around or whatever maybe so mike i saw your hand went up <laughs> do you have something to add to that well I, actually charlotte uh, nailed it uh, we're both south enders so uh, we have an interesting perspective on things but uh, <laughs> uh when it comes to a word I, I mean, the word neighborly comes to mind uh, and something that we're always talking about is walkability. But uh, as, as you'll get to know, my quirky personality is, is when you ask me what time it is, I'll, I'll, I'll build a watch because there's more to say in our, our neighborhood than, than just that. And, and what comes to mind besides what uh, Brad and Charlotte have done, holding on to that building all this time and being an active member of the neighborhood for the past 30 years, uh, uh, but but across the street from them, there's a barber shop, uh, a props barber shop, and Jeff is the uh, the master barber. And and one of the quirky things of our neighborhood is we've had a barber in that building in that spot since 1902. Uh, and so uh, it's it, it's it's just way cool, and and it's interesting. 
um, I'm using the barber analogy, but when, when we, before pro, uh, COVID, of course, but when I'd be in there waiting for uh, my haircut, uh, you would have kiddos come in and the first thing that, that uh, Jeff would do is turn off the, uh, the turn down the volume of, of the television or, or put on some show uh, sports thing. Uh, and, and so you have these young people coming in uh, with, with the old geezers like me and, and there'd be gossip and, and silliness and, and, and uh, a conversation. Um, and it truly is a place where you would, you would uh, come to uh, old fashioned type of barber. And then Caddy Corner is the uh, champagnery, uh, which, which I, I just love. And then across the street from that on the same side of Frankfurt Avenue, then, then you've got the Hilltop Tavern. Hilltop Tavern. Uh, and then across from that is, is the uh, Silver Dollar, which used to be the firehouse. Uh, but also part of our neighborhood is uh, the railroad tracks. Uh, it, and it's something that, that we deal with. Uh, in our neighborhood, we've got industrial, D.D. Williamson. Uh, we, we've got uh, uh, a commercial with, with, resident, with restaurants that are, are, most of our restaurants are actually businesses on Frankfurt Avenue are locally owned, uh, which is way cool. Uh, and then we've got 2000 residents. Uh, and one thing that, that I've always enjoyed in our neighborhood is, is a lot of folks have front porches and during the, the summer when it's warm, people will be sitting on the front porch and with the walkability, they'll, they'll wave at each other with, and, and they mean it sincerely as opposed to other issues. But anywho, uh, but uh, my, my idea, is, my, my thought when you, you said that for word is neighborly. Uh, and and I, I think uh, we are an urban neighborhood uh, and we still have that, uh, at that point where, you know, uh, uh, Joanna lives across the street from me on Payne Street, and I was looking out the front door, uh, being kind of Gladys Kravis, and I saw her husband was shoveling the the uh, the snow from the front uh, walk, uh, and and that kind of gave me a sense of comfort. It's like, uh huh, this is what it's all about, and that's how I, I look at the mural in a sense, where people it could be a safe place where people can come with families or adults. It could be an outdoor learning uh, process, outdoor classroom and that, that people can come and touch it, feel it, talk about it. And then uh, those who visit us, then they go home and they can talk about this great piece of art, which is actually an inter, uh, a place where you can actually be involved in. So I guess it goes back again to my idea of, of neighborly. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, that was great. And it's so interesting because in the chat, Sarah Lundgren had mentioned trains passing through the neighborhood is something that is pretty, um, is pretty poignant and I can realize that because uh you know I I've been around that neighborhood trying to get past and there's always a train <laughs> um so some well, of the to add on onto that really quick I don't think you know a lot of people coming through Frankfurt don't realize how important that railroad was to the creation of the neighborhood which is I think is really you know interesting to think about too and I love what Mike had to say about the porches because I live on Sycamore and I think half of Clifton walks by my house with their dogs and um, it's great entertainment for a five-year-old so if you, if you have a five-year-old on Sycamore Avenue yelling what's your dog's name that's probably my kiddo <laughs> Um, some of the other things in the chat, um, John Roberts said inclusive and diverse. Um, we also have from Catherine Cohen, Keystone. Uh, Michelle Brown says energy, activity. Uh, Jonna says, I can't agree more with Mike. <laughs> so um, we are reached our limit for time. But I will just leave it very quickly open to if anyone has any questions or things that we need to reflect on as we move forward in this process, please let us know. Anybody have anything? I I want to um, I want to take just a minute to to uh, to mention something, and I hope I I hope I'm not catching Liz by surprise here. I don't think I am. I think we we've had some exchange about this, but um, I want to kind of um, I'm going to. I think he can handle it. I'm going to I'm going to point to the fact that you know Mike Mike has called this a mural when we started that word was in the proposal title. And as we've gone uh, through this process of community listening and engagement, we've learned that um, we probably need to expand the way we think about what this is. And we've we've tried and I, I'm going to fully admit like I for the last round of this, I was calling it the multimodal public artwork for Clifton. 
and I'm going to just multimodal is terrible. It's terrible. It's not going to work. Um, but <laughs> what I came up with, I'm trying to redeem myself. And, and in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to riff on this, the, the word multifaceted, which a couple of people really resonated with here a moment, moments ago, uh, multi-sensory. I think multi-sensory is getting a lot closer to what we need, right? Um, it embraces the idea that this is not just a traditional two-dimensional image on a surface like most murals would be. Is it, is it possible that the final thing, people will see it from a distance and say, oh, look at that mural? Maybe, maybe, but we hope that it will have uh, on closer inspection, you know, a lot of things that aren't typically uh, included in a mural. So it is, you know, so for now, uh, I'm going to throw that out there. I know we do need to wrap up, but I just want to let people know that we're kind of tracking toward thinking of this as a multi-sensory public artwork um, and, and with a particular emphasis on making it as accessible as possible to blind and visually impaired folks um, for all the reasons that have been discussed. Um, so I see some nodding. I see Katie's nodding. I appreciate that very much. Uh, but if people want to you know, propose something else or, or have a different idea about that, uh, please, please, uh, please do. But I do want to, I just want to remind us that um, you know, I think we've committed ourselves to thinking in an expansive way about what this is, and uh, it will have probably some recognizable aspects of a mural, but we hope it will, will go way beyond that, too, uh, in order to accomplish all of its great purposes that Liz provided for us. So. Um, Carrie, you had your hand up, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that I, I do an opportunity oh, to see. Thank you. Two things. Um, one, when I visited people before I lived in Clifton and visited in Clifton, the inclusivity and connectedness were huge. And my next question is, because I'm late, I'm very sorry, but did you guys give the URL for our the website? Thank you. We we don't have that yet, but everyone that's in the um, everyone that's in this call will get that once it goes once it goes live. For now. Um, there is, let me, I'm gonna to have to double check it. I'm so sorry to have to do this. Uh, so right now, if you go to louisvisualart.org forward slash Clifton dash project. So louisvisualart.org forward slash Clifton dash project. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy that and put it in the chat. Let me make sure I get it to everybody here. So for right now, Terry and, every, and everyone else, that is where you know, we have some information. Um, but the website that we're talking about that's going to go live and be a, sort of a standalone thing, we're not, uh, not ready to publish that address just yet. want to make sure we have that exactly right before we republish that. Uh, but that will, that will, you're not going to have to wonder or wait. We're going to reach out to everybody that's in the circle uh, in a really deliberate way to make sure you know that that's there. We're going to put it on our own social media at Louisville Visual Art, so it won't be a secret. Um, one of the last things that were in the chat, um, Jonna asked about upkeep maintenance of art as well as web component. And that is always something people are very, very curious about. Um, we put in the budget for there to be maintenance. So that's something that we will um, figure out how many, uh, how much time that actually is. The city, Sarah Lindgren, would be able to help give input on what is typical uh, and we will be in discussions with her, but there will be maintenance. And as far as the website itself, that would be uh, for at least some time, it would be LVA that was maintaining that with Liz's uh, explicit input. Uh, Patrice also wrote, um, she said the steeper hills have made an impression on her in her walks around the KSB campus and like the idea of relief aspects to art. Uh, so at the end of this, because we, I wish we could be here forever, but I'm sure not everybody wants to be here forever. Um, Liz, would you please just close us out um, for today? Yeah, thank you, Katie and Grant for facilitating this conversation. This is what gives me like re-energized and, and hyped up for the project. Um, you know, obviously I'm passionate about the Clifton neighborhood and I love it dearly. Um, but seeing you all react to things and a lot of the similar ideas that I've had, um, that's, that's teaching me that I'm on the right track. And that's what I'm looking for is that like synergy, you know, of ideas of um, these are things that we all have in common and that we love about our neighborhood. And that's really what I wanna draw from 
the most because that will give me the results that will be meaningful to the most people. So thank you all for sharing those ideas. And um, my email address is also in, in those group emails that you got leading up to this meeting. So feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I also have public social media pages. It's just Liz Richter Art on Facebook or Instagram. If you ever you know, have just an idea or think of something or have a visual or just feel like sharing anything about this project that you didn't think of during this meeting, um, feel free to share those ideas with either Grant or myself directly. And thank you so much, all of you for your time once again and, and go team, I'm super, super pumped to get going. All right. Bye, everybody. So nice to have seen you.